So good morning, good evening, good late night, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. In 2018, the American Heart Association issued a new guideline, and it said, if you have a positive calcium score, you don't need to take a statin. Well, I'm not going to get into the statin haters perspective on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that negative calcium score actually means. For those of us who study plaque, who look at things like IMT, there's always been this little bit of an edge because we've always wondered, well, what if the person has plaque, but it's all soft plaque? In other words, plaque without calcium. Could that possibly happen? Well, the answer is yes. And we've got a study today to show exactly that. So just when you thought it was safe to, uh, to not worry about cardiovascular disease, you got a negative calcium score. You're safe. You're good to go. Mm, not so fast. You know, there are a lot of things about calcium scores that can be uh, confusing and frustrating. For example, I mean, none of us would argue with the higher the calcium score, the more risk that you have. But I have patients, many, many patients, and many of them, they're very good that say, you know, they come to, in fact, the most common reason for coming to see me is somebody discovered a positive, positive calcium score. And then they get to work. They lose that 30 pounds of fat. They gain muscle. They start doing the things they're supposed to do. And then uh, in most cases, they'll go ahead and bite the bullet and start taking some medications as well. And then they expect, okay, I'm going to repeat that calcium score and do a victory lap because my calcium's gone entirely or my calcium has decreased. My calcium score has decreased. So therefore my risk has decreased. And then they turn around and it's the calcium is higher. Again, those of us who study calcium much more clearly, much uh, more in detail, understand that when you stabilize plaque, it's like stabilizing a scar sometimes. And Cal calcium, calcification of that plaque means that it is stabilized. So this is one of those areas where mm, it's not quite that simple. So before we get to that, we'll talk a little bit about previous topics. Again, if you haven't been to this channel before, we're all about helping people prevent uh, the things that kill and disable most of us. Because unfortunately, you know, I don't mean to say this in a bad way, but it's true. Our doctors don't. Our doctors can't. You know, it's the the science is really clear. The evidence shows that two thirds of doctors really don't understand the major underlying driving uh, causes of heart attack and stroke. And heart attack is the number one cause of death. Strokes the number one cause of permanent disability. And the thing that's coming up. Uh, rapidly is Alzheimer's, dementia. It's also cardiovascular disease for the most part. Number one cause of blindness, diabetes. Number one cause of kidney disease, kidney failure, same thing. So it's all about our arteries. And unfortunately, again, two thirds of docs that are responsible for taking care of you in this space don't understand it well enough to diagnose it, let alone to manage it. So, uh, you know what? Uh, it's reality. You got to deal with it. It's unfortunate, but you got to learn. And it's not that difficult. That's what this channel is all about, helping you understand the details on how to take care of yourself. So, other topics, for example, uh, that we've covered is obesity, uh, is overeating really the cause of obesity? Pardon the, we've got a couple of uh, typos in there. Uh, patient stories. We've had other uh, content and we'll continue to provide content all around about helping you prevent your most likely cause of death or disability. We've got courses. Uh, they're cheap and or even free and they 
deal with the core issues that most docs tend to not understand. Cardiovascular inflammation, uh, insulin resistance, how to diagnose it, how to deal with it, and plaque. You know, it's what we're talking about today. One of the more popular ways of dealing with plaque. A lot of people uh, that watch me, my channel used to watch um, uh, Igor. I can't remember Igor's last name. Uh, he got, he, he took a detour with uh, when the pandemic came in, but it looks like he's getting back into uh, plaque and evaluation and, he does a lot of focus on the calcium score. As you'll see today, there are problems with the calcium score. Um, I use both the calcium score and IMT. In fact, IMT, it's got its problems. There is no perfect way. If there was, we'd all be doing it. Uh, the, the problems with IMT are um, garbage in, garbage out, understanding this, the quality and technique of the of the way that score was developed. With calcium score, it's really uh, easy to get the correct score, but understanding what it means is the problem. And it doesn't tell us about soft plaque. That's the downside for calcium score. The downside for IMT is valuation. It's the only thing that'll tell us about soft plaque. So get some of those courses, take a couple of hours and you'll learn more than your doc and you'll be able to protect your own health. Uh, things continue to, to ramp up at the Alabama project. More, uh, more and more to do there. Very interesting. Lots of fun. If you haven't taken a look at the prevention myths book, this book, it was the first, our first book out of the blocks. And it's all about how, you know, a, a stress test, you know, your brother dies or a family member, your uncle dies and you get worried because you got you share a lot of genetics with that individual. And, you know, you've got some cardiovascular risk. So you go to the doctor and you say, hey, why don't we just get a stress test? Well, you get a you pass your stress test with flying colors. That's not going to guarantee that you don't die. That's exactly what happened to Tim Russert? And we go into detail on what happened with Tim Russert and why it happened that way and what you can do to make sure that you don't. Now, we're going to have a, a short topic today. We've got so many topics uh, piled up over the next few months. What we've started doing is just doing uh, in, our, in our videos, we'll do a short topic and then the longer topic. So again, today, the longer topic is if you think you're safe because of a zero calcium score, think again. Here's the short topic. It's something that happens time and time and time again. It's happened with metformin several times. It's happened with um, ramipril, the ACE inhibitors. And now it's happening with another ACE inhibitor. This one is quinapril. And what are we talking about here? It's a recall and it's associated with some contaminant. How bad is the contaminant? Well, it's a contaminant. Let's just go. Let me go back to the script. Acuretic, quinapril, hydrochloride and hydrochlorothiazide. It, that's a double pill. I don't recommend these double pills that use uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide is a, an old blood pressure medication. It used to be frontline until we learned better. Now, if you're going to combine blood pressure meds, and, and that does make sense. You should use a calcium channel blocker and an ACE inhibitor <clears throat> or a calcium channel blocker and an ARB if you can't take an ACE inhibitor. This combination is an ACE inhibitor, quinapril, and a fluid pill, hydrochlorothiazide. So if you're on that, uh, think twice, see your doc, get a better combination anyhow. Uh, lose the, the fluid pill, the hydrochlorothiazide, and get with a calcium channel blocker if you can. Now, Pfizer's the maker. It's recalling lots. Not, lots in this term doesn't mean a whole bunch. It means significant separate lots of the, um, the medication. Medication name is Acuretic, and here's the, um, here's the problem. It's nitrosamine contamination. Now, again, so everybody thinks, well, the 
the methods for making these things must be awful. I'm not going to make a comment on that. What I am going to say is this contaminant, you know, I used to work in, um, in occupational medicine. And as a major part of that, I do a lot of, did a lot of toxicology. You know, you're looking at chemicals that can, that are technically poisons. Well, nitrosamines are technically poisons, but before you decide that, oh my gosh, run for the hills, understand a little bit more of the details. Nitros nitrosamines are very common. They're in water and foods and almost all cured or grilled meats. It's not likely at all that you're going to grill, uh, you know, grill some shrimp, grill something on the, uh, grill some fish, grill some salmon, grill some beef. It's not at all likely that you're going to grill that and eat it without getting significant nitrosamines. You also find these nitrosamines in dairy and vegetables. Everybody's been exposed. It's very, very common in our environment. But that doesn't mean that there are no safety rules around them. There are, these are impurities that can increase the risk of cancers with continued exposure. <clears throat> and those are the rules. No re immediate risk has been identified for patients that are currently taking this product, just like they had it with previous recalls of lots of uh, metformin, as well as certain lots of ramipril. So just be aware. Now, let's go. If you'll give us the water ball, Gilbert, we'll go into today's topic. So you got curious, you went to um, uh, MRIs or X-rays R Us down on the corner. You got a calcium score. It came back zero. You're good to go. You can stop taking your statin, right? That's exactly what the American Heart Association said just two years ago. Before you jump back in the water, be aware. There was a, an article recently October 27th, uh, 2021, in um, JAMA Cardiology, very, very well-known uh, journal, JAMA, JAMA, one of the top maybe half dozen medical journals in the, in the world, Journal of the American Medical Association. In fact, there's a series or networks of JAMA. There's the regular JAMA, then JAMA Cardiology, JAMA Internal Medicine, this one's JAMA Cardiology. Here's the title, Association of Age with the Diagnostic Value of Coronary Artery Calcium Score for Ruling Out Coronary Stenosis in Symptomatic Patients. You know, it's interesting. Titles can be a problem, right? It's, uh, could you have understood, would you have picked up on that had you just seen that title? No. You know, people on YouTube are, uh, have taken uh, clickbait kind of titles to a to a new level. Maybe the guys in academics could uh, learn a little bit about that in terms of helping people understand that's not going to draw eyeballs and people are going to miss the significance. It's going to go right over their head. But the evidence is very interesting and it's very helpful to know. This was a study published in JAMA, as we mentioned, last October. The diagnostic value of a zero coronary artery, artery calcium score to rule out obstructive coronary artery disease really hasn't been clear. So the objective of the study was to assess the diagnostic value of a coronary artery calcium score of zero for reducing the risk of obstructive coronary artery disease. The design was a cohort study Information from the Western Denmark Heart Registry, and it had a median follow-up time of 4.3 years. They included patients age 18 or older who underwent a CTA, computed tomography angiography. It's a type of way of looking at the arteries. You put some um, uh, radionuclide dye in a, in a vein, like in the arm, and then you start taking pictures, especially when that nuclide gets to the arteries of the heart. 
the the catchment time was January uh, 2008 to December 2017 for looking for symptoms associated with coronary artery disease. In other words, you'd say, well, why would an 18 or 25 year old get one of these? Well, they had symptoms and they happened to go ahead and get this. So if they got this study, the CTA, they said, let's go ahead and get a calcium score while we're at it using this you know, similar technology in these individuals and see the predictive value of a zero calcium score. Now, here's a critical point. How did they define obstructive coronary artery disease? It was defined as 50% or more occlusion. In other words, the lumen, the, the, the hole in where, where the blood flowed in these arteries was more than 50% blocked. So the reason that's an important issue, it's important in a couple of ways. The first one is as many as they got here, multiply it times, gosh, we don't know how many, maybe 10 times because there are a lot of people that have obstruction less than 50, that have obstruction or have plaque, but it's less than 50%. What's even more significant about that is this. Two thirds of the people that have a heart attack don't have 50% obstruction of their flow. They have plaque, but it's less than 50%. So as you can see here, their definition of, of obstructive coronary disease is missing most of the people that have risk due to plaque in the coronary arteries. Let me repeat that. The way they designed this study, they're missing most of the people that had a zero calcium score and still had plaque. They're only picking up people that had a zero, zero calcium score and had so much plaque that they had over 50% occlusion. The other, uh, uh, another more practical point, which I made a second ago and I'll repeat is, they're also missing the vast majority of people that have uh, risk. Again, two thirds of heart attacks happen with people that have plaque, but it's not 50% occlusion. So <clears throat> coronary artery calcium score and CAD, the main outcomes, the proportion of individuals with obstructive CAD, in other words, more than 50% occlusion, yet they had a calcium score of zero. The results, 23,759 symptomatic patients were included. Again, these were people that had symptoms. That's why they were getting CTA and calcium score on um, some of these, some of these were young people. Some of them were, were you know, in their 60s and 70s as well. 54% had a zero calcium score. The overall prevalence of, so that's what, about 12,000. Uh, overall, maybe a little bit more. Overall prevalence or portion of obstructive coronary artery disease was 3% in those younger than 40 and 8% on those 70 or older. Think about that. So you have symptoms, you get a coronary uh, calcium score, it's negative. If you're younger than 40, the probability is that uh, what one out of th what one out of 30 that you have so much plaque in there that it's a more than 50% obstruction. Wonder what portion of people had less than 50% plaque and didn't get picked up. From those with obstructive coronary disease, 14% had a calcium score of zero. Prevalence decrease uh, depending on age with 58% of those 39 to 68 years old to 5% on those 70 years of old or older. So more results on this study. The added diagnostic value of a zero calcium score decreased at a younger age with a risk factor adjusted diagnostic ratio uh, of a zero calcium score ranging from 0.68 to 
or 30% lower likelihood of obstructive coronary disease in younger than 40 to 0.18 uh, on those 70 and older. Now, if that's confusing you, you're not alone. It confused me a couple of times too. I think the, the basic point behind it is the zero calcium score when you have symptoms is even more likely to be wrong and uh, hiding risk if you're younger. Now, think about it. When you think about it, if that's the case, that actually makes sense because what we've always been concerned about, those of us that understand plaque and how it works and how calcification is actually a demonstration of, of uh, the process of stabilizing, when you think through all that, it makes more sense that young people are more likely to be in this risk category because they just have not had the time yet to start calcifying that soft plaque. They've had time to start developing soft plaque, but they haven't had time to start calcifying it. And that's really the people that we've been worried about from day one. What if somebody had started to develop plaque, it's started out soft, which it always does during that inflammatory phase, and it had not had time yet to stabilize. And sure enough, we tend to see that more likely in younger people. The presence of obstructive versus non-obstructive uh, coronary artery disease among those with a calcium score was associated with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.51. And again, I don't really care that much about whether it's obstructive or non-obstructive because two thirds of the heart attacks happen in people that don't have obstructive. So really the only the major thing that that might tell you is, again, there's a significant, as you would expect, uh, using that number of 1.51, there's a significant increase uh, of the number of people uh, that have plaque uh, compared to those that had obstructive plaque. So conclusions and key points, at least conclusions and key points of the authors. And as you know, I have a different perspective on some of these. I was an epidemiologist at Hopkins and epidemiologists study studies. And they look at the quality of the study. They look at what's known about the science. They look at the evidence and they'll often come up with some different conclusions. I think I've already shared with you some of my conclusions, but uh, I, I also share one of the key conclusions that these folks came up with. Significant proportion of uh, obstructive uh, coronary artery disease occurred among younger patients without a positive calcium score. And Overall, I agree that that's a major risk. I don't think that's the major finding. The major finding is that a lot of folks have plaque, especially younger folks, even though they had a, pos a, a zero calcium score. And again, the difference between my conclusion and the author's conclusion is I'm not worried so much about whether it's obstructive. I don't look at plumbing. I know that inflammation and soft plaque is the risk, whether it occludes the artery or not. The diagnostic value of a calcium score of zero to rule out uh, artery disease was dependent on age with added diagnostic value being smaller for younger patients. In symptomatic patients younger than 60, obstructive artery disease occurred among those without a calcium score with an increased risk of myocardial infect, infarction and all heart attack and death. So remember, calcium score does not detect soft plaque. That is the significant limitation of the calcium score. So thank you very much. This was the major content for today. And Gilbert, if you will give us the transition, we'll go into Q&A.
So thank you, Gilbert. And I can tell you, we've got, as you can see, we've got a, a healthy or a whole lot of people joining us already, and we're getting a lot of questions. Let me see uh, if I can manage those, how many we can get to. Good morning, Bambi Grage. Good to hear from you. Rachel Watson, is a scan done by EBCT is valid for SCORE? I don't know that I can answer that, Rachel. It's a good question. Sorry that I can't. Bobby Ocampo, Muba, Mabu Hey. God bless you for helping save lives. Bobby, Mabu Hey to you, and thank you so much. Bobby lives in the Philippines, and that is, can't remember what language that is, but Mabu Hey to you. Rachel, sorry, that should re read by, not be. Yeah, got it. And I, I do think that it is. I'm just going to say, be very careful about just making that assumption. Uh, that is not an informed uh, opinion. Bayless Code. What's a bad calcium score? I had a score of one. One's not so bad. In fact, it's very low. It's, it's scored... Uh, it's like one to one to 88 or one to 100, depending on, on what you're looking at. And a bad one is like two or three thousand. Anything over a thousand is a pretty significant calcium score. But any calcium score means, number one, anything other than zero means that you've had plaque. It always starts as soft plaque. And it's already started to stabilize. In other words, the stabilization process of soft plaque forms calcium. I've got tons of people that come to me. As I, I think I mentioned earlier, the, mo the most common reason for coming to see me is somebody found a positive calcium score. And I've got tons of people that came to see me with calcium scores of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 and more. And as you might guess, um, I tend to see a lot of middle-aged and older men. And you might also guess that generation of men tend to have a, a macho component and really don't believe in crying. But I cannot tell you the number of middle-aged men that have come to me and broken into tears because of their calcium score. I'll also tell you, not a one of them has remained that worried after getting some time to work on this. Now, again, that doesn't mean that there's no confusion. It just means that they get used to understanding what a uh, plaque stabilization means. So thank you, Bayless. Good, uh, good comment. Good question. I'm not sure that I answered it uh, completely, but um, hopefully I, I helped in that area. Rachel A., my doctor swore I had plaque. My score was zero. Hmm, it's a good, good point, Rachel. You know, maybe you did have plaque and maybe it was soft. Have you had an IMT? That's the question because IMT or more often called CIMT, with all the problems that it has, is the only technology, the only test that'll show whether you not whether you have soft plaque or not. And as you might remember, it's not calcified stable plaque that causes the risk. It's soft plaque. Soft plaque is where your body, you're taking friendly fire. Your body is attacking the plaque that's in your arteries. The definition of cardiovascular inflammation. The Bayless Code, I'm 37, I think, that's what you're saying. Lucian P., my doctors told me I have mild atherosclerotic plaque, but didn't give me the number score. So guess what? Saying you have mild plaque is sort of like saying you have mild sugar problems. Mild, uh, more people die from mild plaque, mild sugar problems than from severe ones. And now why is that? Well, the severe ones are a bigger risk, but the problem is it's like this whole thing. Two thirds of the people uh, die, that have a heart attack have less than 50% blockage of their coronary arteries. 
there are so many more people with mild problems even though the mild may be a lower risk, it's still a risk. Please don't ignore it. Thank you so much, Lucian. Uh, Bart, good morning, everyone. Great topic. Thank you so much, Bart. Good to hear from you. Rachel A., I refuse to get on a statin, but I have the gene for heart disease. Well, I would ask, do you mean uh, 9P21? And if you do, there's a whole bunch, over half of us have that gene. Uh, there are other genes that we, would talk, we could talk about as well. And here's the thing. Um, statins, uh, a whole lot of people hate statins. I'm, I'm comfortable seeing patients that don't want to be on a statin. See them all the time. And, and here's why. Because I haven't gotten that sucked into the medical assumption that everything's about giving out medications. You know what? Lifestyle is hands down more important than any medication. I cannot, and no doctor can out-prescribe a lifestyle problem. Unfortunately, that's the standard of medicine these days. It's to hand out pills when they're not as effective. But patients, you know, patients get used to it. That's the expectation. It's a heck of a lot easier and doctors get used to it. That's the expectation. And that's a heck of a lot easier. So they get their eyes off the ball and they get focused on medication. Bobby Ocampo, what's the association of liver tests with inflammation, AST, ALT? Uh, AST and ALT um, are what we call liver functions. They're enzymes that are found in the liver cells. And when you have injury or inflammation to a liver cell, you'll get some leakage of that internal, uh, internal to the liver enzyme, whether it's AST or ALT. So that's how we measure inflammation to the liver. That's not the same as inflammation to the arteries which is also not the same as inflammation to the gastrointestinal tract, which is not the same as inflammation to the thyroid, which is not the same as inflammation to the joints. Now, there is a major overlap between inflammation, especially to the joints. In fact, most people don't know this, but uh, for those relatively few people that have it, Full-blown rheumatoid arthritis is as much of a risk for heart attack and stroke as full-blown diabetes. Again, most people just don't know that. Is there that much overlap between cardiovascular inflammation and other types of inf inflammation? <clears throat> uh, no, the most striking one is with, uh, with uh, joint disease. Uh, for those patients, I've got a lot of patients with rheumatoid. I've got a lot of patients with psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, which um, involves the skin and the joints. And both their doctor, their rheumatologist and I will be following one thing and at least one thing uh, in common, which has to do with inflammation. And that is the HSCRP, the C-reactive protein. Um, so... Again, hope, but you don't tend to see nearly as much overlap between these and uh, these liver function inf inflammation tests and cardiovascular. Now, one place where you will see that is in fatty liver. I'm not going to go much deeper on that. Thank you so much, Bobby. Really good question. Don Barry, I'm a meta metabolic disaster survivor, I think. Don, thank you so much for sharing that. And I will tell you this, you're not alone. Fort Worth, West Side, Ivor Cummins. Thank you. I, you know what? I get so, I, I get on, uh, on YouTube and demonstrate my senior moments where I forget, you know, I have word finding problems, but, you know, I've got a very gracious audience who tends to, uh, to accept it and move on. JM20, I've been following your channel since your first video in 2017. Wow. JM20, this is the first time I've heard that name. Thank you so much. I never comment because I'm always working, but you have the best YouTube channel. 
and have helped me immensely. Thumbs up. Well, thank you so much, JM. And um, I appreciate that. Yeah, if you, if you do a thumbs up, that uh, tells the AI, the artificial intelligence or the algorithm that this is worth looking at. And in fact, if you refer it to something like uh, Facebook or one of your other social media platforms and that pulls somebody over from that platform, the AI really gets excited about that. So thank you so much. And just I'm excited about your comment, JM20. Thank you so much. Bobby Ocampo. Yes. Ivor Cummins. Tom Adams. Olive oil and avocado oil, as well as olives and avocados. Exactly right. You know what? In some demonstration experiments, I have proven that you can be completely vegan and still keto. And what you have to do, though, is you have to be very much comfortable with the idea that you're going to get most of your calories from olive oil and avocado oil. Most people think, oh, you know, keto is only for people eating a whole lot of bacon and red meat. Well, that's what you tend to see. But and they also think, oh, you can't be plant based or um, vegan and keto. And that's uh, those are trends, but they're not completely true. When you brought up olive oil and avocado oil, that reminded me of that concept. Bambi Grage, is there another test besides IMT that shows soft plaque? Nope, there's not. That's the only test. It's been difficult for me to get an IMT in my area. Have talked with Cardio Risk to find a provider. I would need to fly somewhere. Big cost. That's unfortunate, but true. Uh, there's there's a, a, a good provider in Atlanta, Georgia. There's a good provider in, um, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Although I've had some recent complaints about uh, the latter. The only one that goes across the country is, um, is this group, Cardio Risk. So actually what we will, uh, what I'll often see is somebody, for example, in Northern New York, who says, you know what, I go to Florida once a year and I get my CIMT while I happen to be in Florida for vacation. So it's a, it's a little bit of a headache that you're not really accustomed to doing. It's not in our culture to think about, I'm going to plan a trip and this once a year trip, I'm going to go get a medical test. But, you know, things are not, uh, I didn't create reality. I'm just reporting on it. Thank you, Bambi. Leo Acapulco, good morning. Will you talk about vitamin D3 and K2? I will. Um, <clears throat> D3 was discovered long, long ago. And they talked about avoiding things like, uh, I think, pellagra. Uh, rickets, for sure. Uh, no, pellagra, I think, might have been nice. And rickets was... Um, a bone disease, and it was from having very, very low vitamin D levels. And <clears throat> you may remember this old thing about castor oil. Castor oil is a fish oil, and it has huge amounts of vitamin D, and it certainly prevented rickets. So once they got past that, the medical community and our society said, okay, we're good. Then about 10, 15 years ago, we started discovering that maybe not. In fact, as we started looking at vitamin D3, we started finding that it had a lot bigger impact than we thought and not just strong, healthy bones. <clears throat> we also found out that it's not entirely innocuous. It's not entirely harmless either. Uh, some people have been given too or taken too much vitamin D3 and shut their kidneys down, even died. So as you get involved with uh, supplementing for vitamin D3, be aware of that. So the, how do you, how should you supplement for vitamin D3? I'll make one other comment about some of the importance. They've found importance in terms of sleep, importance in terms of endocrine issues, and specifically importance around uh, potential diabetes. They thought that that was just not really good science until the recent pandemic. And sure enough, they found major differences in survival rates depending upon serum levels of vitamin D3. 
I'll uh, I'll go down one other quick bunny hole. For a while, there were a lot of docs that gave vitamin D2. It's a similar vitamin. It impacts the similar things. And it was thought to be a kinder, gentler v- form of vitamin D. Although it's true, it is kinder and gentler. It just doesn't work as well. So you see far fewer people using or taking vitamin D2 at this point. Now, <clears throat> um, so how do you take vitamin D3? I've, I've reviewed this. And, and one of the things is people say, oh, well, you want to get out in the sun. I, I do this for a living. I do this all day, every day. And I see people, a husband that's playing golf three and four times a day or working out in the sun. I mean, a week, I'm sorry, not a day. Or working out in the sun and they're vitamin D3 deficient, whereas the their wife, their spouse never goes out in the sun and has good vitamin D3 levels. So be careful about assuming you're going to get it from the sun. The second thing is um, color. There's, there's this assessment or this statement assumption because uh, people of color have pigment and therefore they don't get as much sun. Therefore they're more likely to have vitamin D deficiency. I haven't seen that true pattern either. It certainly makes sense, but in terms of reality, at least in my own patient population, it hasn't hasn't borne out. In fact, most people are vitamin D3 deficient. Here's another thing to think about. Uh, It's just a good rule of thumb to go ahead and start with 5,000 international units of vitamin D3. Now, um, You really do need to get a a level, though, and start titrating your dosage to the level. Uh, I've had uh, more than one patient come to me that had levels over 100. Um, Both of them were taking 10,000. One of them was taking a 10,000 unit per day every day, and another one was taking a 25,000 unit per day every day. Those large units were made to take once a week or, you know, much less often. And you'll also hear and see on the internet, some people make comments, oh, levels of 105 are just fine. That's the target. No, that's not. Look up the science, look up the evidence. People have died from levels over 100. So be very careful, uh, but go ahead and think about supplementation. Now I haven't mentioned vitamin K2 yet at all. Vitamin K is very different. It's the vitamin K that's used for clotting. But then they discovered there's another vitamin K called K2. It's, it, there is some relation, but the relationship between K and K2, other than structural relationship, is not that well defined. We do know that people that are on vitamin K antagonists do have some calcification issues of their vessels. But let's put that aside and don't not deal with that. We've got enough to deal with just talking about vitamin K2 itself. There was a book, the, something like the Vitamin K2 Miracle or something by a, a, a French Canadian doctorate of nutrition or something, uh, Dr. Bleu or something. And she talked multiple times about uh, people taking uh, um fats from animals like um, butter from grass fed animals. And okay, I get all that. And it makes sense. The question is, um, you know, in one book, how many times should you mention that? The reality is I do recommend supplementing with K2. Why are D3 and K2 always recommended together? Because the assumption is they both have to do with calcium. D3, as we mentioned before, strong bones. K2, the assumption is that K2 will help you get that calcium out of your artery walls and into the bones where it needs to be. Does K2 actually do that? There's no evidence. That, well, there's, yeah, well, there's no evidence that it does that directly. Here's where the evidence comes in for K2. There's some enzymes which activated actually uh, take calcium out of bones, osteoclasts, and and then uh, other enzymes that actually put calcium, or cells, not, not enzymes, cells, osteoclasts, 
break down bones and osteoblasts build bones. It's sort of like just any other construction activity. You know, if you've got, if you've got a house and it's crumbling down and you need to rebuild something, you need to go through the effort of taking out rotten walls and putting in new ones. So there's some deconstruction and reconstruction. Osteoclasts do deconstruction and osteoblasts do reconstruction. Now, why am I going that far down that bunny hole? Because, unfortunately, that's the science and the evidence. Well, what's the connection with vitamin K2? Well, these, in, these cells are actually functioning with some enzymes, which are also linked to insulin resistance. So uh, there are studies going on now. There's still more work going on trying to understand vitamin K2. And I strongly suspect that that K2 mechanism is going to be found to be a lot more complicated than what most people think. I think it's going to end up uh, being related to insulin resistance. And in fact, if you look at <clears throat> the studies out there, I actually found a, um, a randomized clinical trial that looked at middle-aged men who had insulin resistance. <clears throat> and this starts to get back to the question of, well, if you take vitamin K2, how much should you take? In that study, they actually had some improvement of insulin resistance. Were they taking the normal uh, 100 micrograms? No, they were taking... 400. And that's what I would recommend if you do take vitamin K2. I do recommend vitamin K2 for those of us who are in this risk category, anybody over 50. And, you know, do a screening uh, insulin resistance test and see, even if you're in the 20s, see where you are in that space. I think that K2 is going to be found to be helpful in that space. But again, that's just Conjecture based on the kind of information that I just shared with you. Bart Robinson, Bambi, CT angiogram, I believe. Theresia Smith. If you do everything possible to halt progression of cardiovascular disease, diet, supplements, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, does it work? Or is progression of cardiovascular disease inevitable? Well, uh, Theresia... Uh, I think it's still a fair assumption that we're all going to die sooner or later. The risk of dying from cardiovascular disease, though, is really high. The number one cause of death is heart attack. It's bounced back and forth. Number two, number three cause of death has been stroke. Number one cause of permanent disability is stroke. You do these things that we're talking about. And you don't completely take all risks for cardiovascular disease off the table, but you take a huge decrease. So just like when you drive a car, if you maintain your speed limit, you greatly decrease the probability that you're going to die in a car crash. But if you drive 120 uh, miles per hour, or if you don't have a speedometer, never look at it, and you get up to 100, 120 miles per hour, you're going to have much, much greater risk. I hope that doesn't seem like I'm stretching an analogy too much, because I'll tell you, I don't think it, I am stretching the analogy. One of the things that we tend to find is that people do not look at their speedometer. How many people do you know? And I'll ask you, Theresia, have you actually done a, a CGM, continuous glucose monitor? If you haven't, then you're one of those people that I'd say been driving for years without a speedometer, never looking. AK, is there, there, yes, there is a perfect way, Doc. I get rid of all animal products. I respect all the academia knowledge you have, but do more research. Consuming filthy animal products killed, almost killed my husband. Well, AK, I, I appreciate your position, but obviously we don't agree. And that's, you know, that happens. E.T. himself, this is a wee bit off topic. Does one's body pH level have an inflammation factor, let's say, of 5.5? There are people that would say that it does. I am not an expert in that area. And the stuff that I've seen that really gets deep into pH, I have a little bit of suspicion about. 
Don Barrow at Leo Acapulco. I'm a fan of K2 and D3, but and would also like to hear this doc talk about it. So I did. Uh, Bart says, AK ridiculous. Lucian, mild arthrosclerotic disease is noted on my abdominal CT scan. Hmm. Well, that means you have plaque, which means you have risk, which means I would recommend you consider, uh, number one, you know, you got to look at all the risks. If you're overweight, that's a big issue, especially as we, get, we age. If you have insulin resistance, if you haven't had an insulin survey, I would clearly get one of those. I would consider baby aspirin. I'd consider uh, low-dose statin. They didn't give me a calcium score number. Um, well, I'm sorry about that, Lucian. ET himself, Don Barry does a great deal in his other videos. Just search his channel. Thank you, AK, ET. AK, go, go plant-based. Okay, got it, AK. Thank you very much. Bart Robinson, you're watching the wrong channel with that attitude. I appreciate it, Art. Bart, and we'll start doing some filtration here. JM20, my cardiologist has me on five milligrams Crestor due to family history and really high LP little a. He said that if I got a calcium uh, score, it wouldn't change what he's doing. I'm in my mid 40s. Well, I got one and it came back zero. Ah, oh, interesting. You know, one thing to think about with calcium score, I mean, with family history is, it's based on an assumption that you're going to get the genes that your family had. You know, like if your mom has an APOE 3-4, um, which of those are you going to get from your mom? The three or the four? Well, you don't know that. The four may have caused your mom problems, but if you didn't get that four, it's not going to cause you problems. So unfortunately, things get complicated, don't they? Bobby Ocampo, when I asked my doctor on my heart evaluation, he recommended a nuclear stress test. We don't have CIMT, so decided to request a calcium score. I have a 20 calcium score. Well, that 20 calcium score, Bobby, means that you've got plaque. You've had soft plaque in the past, and now you've got some calcification, some stabilization of that. And here's the question, how much soft plaque do you have? Black Tangu, does pomegranate juice reduce intima thickness? Um, <clears throat> pomegranate juice has some really good stuff on it. However, or in it, it also has some really bad stuff. Most of us that get this problem get this problem because of insulin resistance. And pomegranate juice, despite all the really good stuff it has in it, just like beet juice with the really good stuff that it has, both of them have some bad stuff. Carbohydrates. So be careful. If you, if you use them, think about the carbohydrate content. Rachel A, 20. That's JM20. That's my story as well. I refuse to take a statin, even low dosage. Steve LeBianca, anyone care to comment on the NMR lipid profile blood tests, which measure particle types and counts rather than the volume in the NMR test counts, not calculate values? You know, Thomas Day Spring is a very well-renowned uh, lipidologist, he doesn't fall down. I mean, he falls down a few of the traps, but really avoids most of the traps that most lipidologists fall into. And he'll say, look, a regular, um, he, here's a good point and a bad point from one comment that he would make. And that is, you don't get so much from a regular uh, cholesterol test. You really need to look at the uh, fractionation and NMR is not fractionation, but it's another way of looking at fractionation-related issues. Overall, he's right, except that he uh, ignores the point that there's a very important number in terms of the triglyceride over HDL ratio, which is a reflection of your carb metabolism. So... I look at fractionation with all my patients, Stephen. So I do think that you do need to look at it. And we, I've got, if you, if you have more questions about it, I spent a whole hour and a half at one, on one video talking about the triglyceride over HDL ratio. Take a look at that and you'll get a lot more detail. It's, um, it's based on the fact that when people get, uh, the carb driven metabolism, insulin resistance is again, the most common cause of this problem. 
once you start getting into problems with that, the particle, the cholesterol that the particles carry the, in the large, fluffy, healthy particles, whether you're talking about HDL or LDL, that cholesterol, which is usually the same, whether it's an LDL or HDL, it's the particle the different, that's different, the, not the, the protein, not the cholesterol. And LDL, large, fluffy LDL is healthy, just like large, fluffy uh, HDL components are the ones that really help. Unfortunately, the large fluffy particles in both of those groups get replaced, the, the cholesterol gets replaced with fatty acids when you start going down that uh, metabolic insulin resistance chain highway. And when a fatty acid laden particle, which would have otherwise been healthy, passes through the liver, the liver metabolizes it. So therefore it chews up the healthy particles. That's why people with, I mean, that's why a, um, a fractionation is so important. How, what is your shift? It doesn't matter quite so much how much your LDL is. What matters is whether it's small versus large, how, what that, what that pattern looks like. Lucian P. I read Stanton's blunder blocked the benefits of cardio. Not, uh, not going to go there too deep uh, other than to make a couple of co comments. I have very, very few people on high dose statins. High dose statins are the ones that are more at risk for doing that. And uh, although I do recommend you consider statins, if you have plaque, it's not so much for decreasing LDL. It's for managing car uh, cardiovascular inflammation. Small dose statins can do that. And again, they don't have the, the big metabolic negative impact that you tend to see with that you hear about with statins. JM20, my cardiologist still wants me on the statin and at, attributes his own calcium score of zero at age 60 to starting statins early. Any thoughts? No more thoughts than I've shared. I, I, uh, I will leave it at that. I, Lucian P, do statins prevent cardio fitness? Well, we just talked about it. JM, I've been on Cresto for over five years. If I had soft plaque in my coronary arteries, it would have hardened by now. Probably, it's, you know, Crestor helps you do that. In fact, you know, people think, well, a lot of people know and understand that statins will actually tend to cause an increase in the calcium score because what those statins are doing are decreasing cardiovascular inflammation and therefore if you decrease the cardiovascular inflammation, if you have soft plaque, you start to calcify it. That's the way that works. Bobby Ocampo then, then requested your recommended inflammation test. Oh, that's so Bobby was talking about what he did. He requested the inflammation test. I hope you were able to get those tests and I hope they helped Bobby. Lucian P at Black Tangu. I drink pomegranate juice almost daily. That is a good question. Bart Robinson, my low dose statin does not affect my cardiovascular endurance at all. Bart, I don't think mine does either. And I don't think my patients that are on those have a significant problem either. There's a similar question about metformin. And again, I think the concerns about metformin and athletic abilities are overdone. Now, if I had a patient who's... Um, world class or even national class level, or maybe regional class and is really concerned about it in terms of athletics, I would have that discussion with them. But I, that's not the discussion that I have over and over and over and over again. It's, you know, just how much do you think metformin uh, impacts you? Same thing with statins. I, I think these concerns about athletic ability and statins and metformin, way, way overblown. Luchan P at JM20, how many people have coronary calcium zero at 60 years old. How? I know a few. Uh, Lucien may know a few, but, you know, I do this for a living and I've got a few. It's not common, but uh, I do know a few. Uh, Lucien, I'm at BART. I'm on low-dose statins, Lavalo, I believe, but how are you certain it's not blocking your endurance? Can you sh care to share your results? Beck S, age 67, calcium score zero, primarily plant-based for years. Beck, I'm jealous. Good for you. Lucian P, it might be dose-dependent. 
there is some dose dependency on this. LPG, genetics, lifestyle, and luck. LPG gave us a, a very nice um, uh, super chat 90, uh, a contribution of $99.99. I really appreciate that LPG. What that does is that helps us get this information out to the rest of the world. We've had several others of those, uh, and oh, here we are, uh, LPG at um, 99, John Tocho at $20. Thank you so much, LPG, uh, John. We've had a couple of others. Again, we've got a lot of questions firing through right now, and I'm trying to handle them. Beck S at $9.99. Again, thank you so much. Clay Townsend at $9.99. What are your thoughts on the CIMT? As I've mentioned it a couple of times, I'm, I'm referring to it as IMT, Intima Media Thickness Test. Again, there's a major, major problem with garbage in, garbage out, Clay. It's a great question. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It is the only test that will show, that will document soft plaque. Another uh, uh, super chat button, this one from Parker Reed for $10. So as you can see, folks, again, these are our major contributions. What we're, as you can see from the channel, what we are doing is saving lives. We're giving in people information that they use that their doctors don't have and don't use uh, to help them save decades of healthy life. So a $10 super chat makes a big difference in terms of getting this information out there. Gilbert, who's co-hosting with me is from the Philippines. And uh, we also have team members from, uh, from Mexico. We've got folks in very, very different economic environments. And these uh, super chat uh, contributions make a big difference. Uh, no matter what your political leaning is, uh, our number five country for uh, uploads on our, um, our, um, oh, I'm having a, I'm having a senior moment. What do you, it's not vlog. It's not video log. It's um, uh, the audio. Uh, it, the number five uh, country in the world is China uploading this information. So, you know what, <clears throat> even if your politics are that you don't like the Chinese government, which, you know, I would agree with, there's still a heck of a, there's billions of people in China who deserve to get information they need to save their lives. So thank you so much for helping us in this space. Beck asks, not everybody does, does well going full on plant-based. I have friends who are just light meat, lots of veg and grains and have wonderful lab numbers. Well, thank you so much, Veg. Here's the problem, Veg. I, I don't have a problem with anything you said except the very last thing, the grains. By the time we're age 30, you know, the CDC will say by the time we're age 60, a third of us can't, uh, a third of us have problems with carbs it tends to burn our arteries. They're wrong. They got the right idea. It's very prevalent, but it's more than 80 million Americans alone. If you look at the JAMA studies, you look at the UCLA studies, it's 50% of us starting at age 30. Grain products are nothing, you know, this quote, complex carbs, whole grains, Look at the glycemic value of whole grain bread. It's what, 67? White grain bread, 77. Uh, glycemic value of sugar is what? In the 60s. So it's like grain products are dangerous for most of us, Beck. I'm sorry. I, yeah, that's just the reality. AK, we had full nutrition panels done since going plant-based, and our levels are pristine. Congratulations to you, AK. I appreciate you sharing that. Lucian P, it's more the processed oils that hurt and the sugar. I will say this again. Most, most of us get a lot more of that carb in the grain products. And, you know, I know I expect to get a lot of haters on that comment, but 
that's the reality. AK, docs are trained by big pharma. They will never give you the real way to get healthy. Well, I am a doc, and I'm not going to take that as, as a personal comment because the vast majority of docs are really. Here's the point. The vast majority of docs are totally wrapped up in the pharmaceutical way of living, and that is unfortunate. Beck S., there it is. Calcium score does not detect soft plaque. Beck, you could not be more right. And you got, you know, you put my whole comment for today's content in a very short, very direct and very clear statement. Cal zero calcium score does not mean that you have no plaque. It does not mean you're at no risk, and despite what the American Heart Association has recommended in their guidelines. Bart Robinson, I have two friends that have been almost full carnivore for two years with a zero calcium score and excellent in Mr. Profile. I think maybe you're talking about MR profile. Rachel A., so less than 60 years old, zero score. What do I do to prevent heart, heart disease? Well, people ask me that, and it's like uh, heart disease is a multifactorial thing. You know, do you have uh, psoriatic arthritis? Do you have thyroid disease? Do you have, what is your BMI? What is your portion of uh, body fat? What is your uh, muscle, uh, you know, the, the portion of muscle and the uh, metabolic profile of the muscle tissue that you have? Uh, what is your genetic makeup? So you start answering all those questions, then I can start answering your question, Rachel. John Tocho would just like CIM tests. Yes, wouldn't we all like for a good quality IMT to be more readily available? I would really appreciate that. Bobby Ocampo. But you know what? Again, I didn't create reality. I'm just reporting on it. I, it's so frustrating. Here's part of my problem, I, and I've shared this one. I've gone on rants on this before. I went a rant on on a rant on this with Todd, um, because so many of my patients, all of my patients these days, basically come in from telemedicine. So when Todd um, Todd uh, uh, Eldridge is the is the guy that owns and runs Cardio Risk, and it is he's got a doctorate in in quality for this kind of screening. So he really does a good job. However, what he does for my patients is he will send them to local doctors near them that, um, that have CIMT programs going with cardio risk. He was doing that with a local lipidologist in Florida. And I had a patient report back to me that the lipidologist came in to see him. The lipidologist, started saying, look, I know that Brewer talks about low carb, but I think that's you know, eating all those fats that you eat with a low carb diet is unhealthy and you should stop your low carb diet. And it's like, really, you know, very, very frustrating. So to your point, John, I wish that things were different. I wish that, you know, my patients didn't have to the vast majority of the docs that allow our, my patients to come in do a great job and don't do that. But life can be frustrating. Thank you so much for sharing. Bobby Ocampo, zero calcium, but other inflammation tests is high. Does it mean that you have soft plaque? Well, you know, Bobby, I, I, we end up going around the horn a lot trying to show evidence of plaque. Sometimes you just see it on a on an x-ray, you know, somebody mentioned, uh, I think it was an x-ray of the abdomen. They saw a little bit of calcification in the aorta. If you see, you know, your dentist might see calcification on a dental x-ray. Anytime you see that kind of calcification, not only have you had soft plaque in the past, you've also had it long enough to form uh, stabilization and uh, hard plaque. Now, what that does is that brings up the question, if you go down that logic, well, if you have cal calcium, that means you've stabilized it. Well, that does that mean you have no risk? No, that doesn't mean that you have no risk. In fact, it means that you've formed plaque 
and at least some of it has calcified, it doesn't mean that all of it has. So more complications, more frustration. A good question, Bobby. Thank you. Bart Robinson, I have a couple of friends that have been full carnivore. Oops, I think maybe we've... Oh, John Tocho, there are 71 watching and only 23 likes. We can do better. Well, John, thank you so much. And actually for our group, thinking about the likes, 23 is not bad, but you're right. We can do better. And yes, it does get that information out to people that need the, to save their lives. LPG, one, two, three, three, eight, at Lucian, exactly. Remove processed foods and sugar, along with intermittent fasting and walking and reduce your inflammation, which is the main goal. I would agree. And I would add muscle mass is a major protective component. Body fat is a major destructive component. But we used to think body fat was a uh, an inert energy storage tissue. And what we have found out, I've got a couple of videos on it. It's anything but. It's an endocrine tissue and it creates endocrine problems that drive insulin resistance, which in turn is the most common driver of this issue. In likewise fashion, muscle actually protects us. One of the biggest risk factors as we age, especially after the mid 60s, is becoming, quote, a little old, a cute little old man or a cute little old lady. Uh, with decreased muscle mass. Why is muscle mass an issue? Because active muscles bypass resistant insulin receptors. Active muscles bypass insulin uh, receptors, so you don't have to worry about your insulin resistance as much. You know, if you think about that, and, and so that's the reason to do this resistance training. That's the reason to do the interval training. Both of them help Increase, the resistance training helps with muscle mass and the interval training helps with the metabolic profile of that muscle. It makes it healthier and more metabolically active. When you think about the science and the evidence, you know, there's always been evidence that if we um, work out three to four times a week, at least three times a week, we have much better longevity, much better health. Guess what? That insulin effect, that bypass of the aging insulin receptors by muscles, that can last up to 48 hours in healthy muscles. You think there might be a correlation to that fact of three hard workouts a week and the impact on health in this thing about 48 hours. Connect the dots. Simon Tro, hi, Doc, from Liverpool. I got a zero score at age 50. Congratulations to you, Simon. Let's hope that it means that you don't have soft plaque only. Beck S., don't, don't forget, exercise to get inflammation down. It seems to me that inflammation is at the root of all disease. That's one of the things that we've been discovering. You know, the cardiologists, there's a fellow named, uh, it's not Gavin Blake. I'm blanking on his name. Somebody help me. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, he's the guy at Harvard, he, like the father of in, inflammation. And uh, he did some of those first uh, Waskopf studies and, and uh, Jupiter trials with, with his friend Gavin Blake, who is also at Harvard. He's continued to do a lot more of it. Blake is not doing quite so much these days. He did the um, studies with things like... Um, Oh, what some of the, he he used uh, some of the gout medication. He used uh, he used a an anti-inflammatory that kids that they use for it's an orphan drug. It's used for kids that have a very unusual form of infantile infantile inflammation. He actually saw significant Kenya Kenyumab is the name of it. Um, Kenya Kenyumab C A N N U K I N you MAB, can you, can you map? And he found that it, lo and behold, this anti-inflammatory used for uh, children's, uh, a rare children's inflammatory disease is an injection and it actually decreased heart attack and stroke. Why? Because exactly what you're talking about, Beck, the cardiovascular disease scientific community has realized that it's inflammation. And it's, you know, even though they realize that, the vast majority will not give up on, oh, no, wait a minute, it's LDL. 
And I'm not going to go deeper down that hole, uh, bunny hole. So Clay Towson, how do you, do you advocate for the CIMT? Yes, I do. And again, it's, as we said before, it's got its problems, just like every other test has its problems. Um, I don't really recommend uh, uh, stress tests so much. That's what that whole book was about. Stress tests are not going to predict it. I do recommend calcium score. I recommend CT angiogram and I recommend IMT. Of the, you know, each of those has its own problems. Um, IMT is the only one out of all of them that shows you the dangerous plaque, the soft plaque. Parker Reed, folks, please make sure you hit the like button. Thank you so much, Parker. I appreciate that. AK, docs are the products of extremely powerful meat and dairy industry and big R, big pharma. Director, God bless you, Dr. Brewer. You're God's gift. Well, thank you so much, Director. I really appreciate that. Uh, as we mentioned, Parker gave us a super chat of 10 bucks. Thank you so much. Director, what's the good of undergoing this test, Dr. Brewer? Just inform informative. Well, you know, there's no perfect test. Everybody tends to approach tests with the assumption that it's that the test is perfect. And, you know, they've approached that. That's the way the American Heart Association, for example, approached calcium scores. And most people that get a calcium score do assume that it's perfect. You know, I mentioned before that I spent time as an epidemiologist at Hopkins. One of the other things that epidemiologists do is they study tests. And, you know, just like human beings, there's no such thing as a perfect human being. There is no such thing as a perfect test. It's frustrating. It's complicated. But that's reality. A.K. Bart Robinson. Oh, my Lord. Come on, guys. Parker Reed, please don't forget to contribute the cost of Dr. Brewer to, uh, to provide all this information. So thank you again so much, Parker, for what you've been doing. Uh, Clay Townsend, 999, thank you so much. And we talked about the CIMT quite a bit. Uh, Beck S., my friends of the life, meat, eat, light meat eaters, great labs in their 60s and not on statins. You know, even when I was, quote, plant-based, I tended to be a little bit of a light meat eater as well, Beck. AK, doctor, if you have a medical office that insurance accepts, tell us the protocol is for how many statins you have prescribed per month. I don't really understand that question. I will tell you, I do recommend that you consider, my, you know, I'm not the, the executive. When I see a patient, I'm a consultant and the patient is the executive. They, the patient makes the decision on what they want to do. And I rarely, in fact, I don't remember if I ever over the past two to three years have recommended a high dose statin. I usually recommend low dose statins because I'm not quite so focused on LDL. I don't really understand your question, but I hope those comments help respond to it. AK, oh, come on, AK, please. Uh, Lucian P, some good news is I heard finally have a treatment for high LP, LP little a, which could save lots of lives. So LP little a, for those of you who don't know it, uh, and in fact, most, most people don't know about it. In fact, most doctors don't know about it. It is a genetic variation of LDL. It uh, actually is associated with significant risk. Now, <clears throat> some people think that it's really more of an, uh, a, like a Band-Aid, something that helps decrease risk. Most think that it brings its own risk, uh, and I fall in the latter category. What Lucian is talking about, and so we haven't had things that would impact LP little a in the past, uh, so you would tend to see, number one, most doctors didn't test for it because they felt like, well, if you don't have anything you can do about it, don't worry the patient with it. That's a little bit paternalistic, uh, at least in my mind. Um, but things began to change. Re well, and I'll just tell you, there was also uh, uh, a supplement. Niacin actually decreases LP little a in most, in most folks that have it, um, that gets a little bit complicated because even if it does, it tends to not, not wipe it out, but decrease it by about 30%. So a lot of people would say, a lot of doctors said, well, it only decreases about 30%, so that's not helpful. 
That's not true. If you look at inflammation panels like we do, and you're watching those and you see this 30% decrease, we tended to see a significant improvement in, in inflammation. So that 30% decrease associated with niacin did appear to be making a big difference. Now, um, things changed. It hit prime time. Bob Harper, you may remember him as the uh, trainer on uh, The Biggest Loser, very popular show where they got people together and worked them out real hard and told them they couldn't eat and they lost a whole bunch of weight, but they never really had the, had the biggest loser graduates or, uh, or um, reunions because people would gain the weight back, which I'm not, I mean, that's another bunny hole, but Barb Harper was the trainer is well known early fifties, worked out a lot, very little fat, significant muscle. And he had a heart attack one day on, on Saturday or Sunday morning when he was working out with a group. And he came out later and he said, yep, it was my mom. It was LP little a. So people began to understand, you know, there's another risk factor out there. You know, it's just yet another one. And it's LP little a. So they started learning about it. Meanwhile, another thing happened. And I'm finally getting to Lucien's comment. They develop using genetic means. You know, people talk about, I'm sorry, I keep trying to avoid things that are politically what uh, inflammatory, but well, I, I've tried, uh, I'm getting less and less worried about avoiding that. A whole bunch of people did not want the, uh, <clears throat> the recent vaccines. They said they were genetically, uh, they were genetically dangerous. Well, this medication, the, these anti-sense drugs were very similar in mechanism in terms of genetics. So anyhow, <clears throat> those of, of us who've been keeping up with that space know that there's anti-sense drugs out there now and they decrease LP little a by factors of 40 to 80, 90%, huge portions, which nothing in the past has done. So the, those clinical trials are going on. Now here's the question, does that decrease the injury rate? There's not been enough experience yet to know. So thank you so much, Lu Chen. Uh, and that was LP Little A, Beck S 999. Thank you so much, Beck. I appreciate that. John Tocho, 69. Regulars may remember. Mine are pretty good. I only take the minimum dose two times a week for cardiovascular inflammation. And inflammation has been my problem. So low dose statins. LPG, if you do take a statin, you may want to take a look at CoQ10. Uh, thank you so much, LPG. I do recommend that anybody taking a statin, go ahead and take a CoQ10. Now, as you get into that science, you start reading about it, you'll hear some folks that say, no, 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 you need ubiquinol. CoQ10 is not uh, biologically available enough. Like so many things in terms of science, there is some truth to that. However, if you dig even deeper, you're better off. I mean, it's not twice as, as available and it's so much more expensive. You're better off just getting twice as much CoQ10 and taking uh, 400 milligrams rather than 200. So again, good point. Thank you so much, LPG. Harvey Ops, can calcium score go down over time as a result of statin and other interventions? The answer is yes. I have two patients that have decreased their calcium score. And it wasn't because they got inflammatory. It was because, the, you know, one of them lost 40 pounds. The other one lost about 20. And both of them were doing the things they needed to do, the diet uh, and other interventions. And both of them were taking statins as well. Would this be a good indication of improvement or could solve plaque? It, the reality is you don't know just from the calcium score itself, but you have to put things together. And both of these guys were clearly improving their situation. There was no question about that. But it's a really good point. And it gets back to that, you know, things are not simple and you got to figure it out. Uh, John Tocho, and I regularly take calcium score every two to three years and have an IMT done annually. Thank you so much, John, for sharing that. Calcium score was zero as late as age 62. 
Most recent done last summer, it was 47. Uh-oh. So us meat eaters are doing just fine. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you, John. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and I would share. Yeah. I Again, I do this for a living, and I don't see people that eat nothing but plants as having a major advantage in this space. I just don't. That's not the reality. There's a lot of passion around what kind of diet you eat, but it's like so many other things where there's a lot of passion tends to be misdirected. Diet is, you can't, there's, there's nothing more important than diet, but it's not the source of your macronutrients. It's how many of, you know, it's whether or not you're insulin resistant, whether or not insulin, whether or not carbs damage you. And it's, if they damage you, how much, how many of those you're eating. And the third thing about diet, how much body fat you have. All those are critical pieces. Okay, you don't have to stay. Thank you. Uh, excellent, John. Good manners is important. Will help your blood pressure. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I, you know what? I get I get trolls every now and then, you know, just like we did today, but I don't really know. I can block it on the other system, but I don't think I can. I don't know how to block it on this. Um, Synergetics, any opinion on this company for IMT? <sighs> no, not really. I, I'm going to avoid making a comment on that. I will say, or a conclusive comment, I, I will say, People have asked me about synergetics in the past, and what I have looked at was not incredibly impressive. Harvey Ops, well, taking nice and change liver enzyme numbers, it can, and be very careful. Um, the, the downside, you know, there's downsides to almost anything we do, and the big downside for niacin is it can cause liver inflammation, and people have even died. The two most important supplements in my space are vitamin D3 and niacin. Both of them have caused death. So it's not like, oh, a supplement is automatically harmless. Mm -mm, not the case. Better not to feed trolls. I have familial, uh, John M, familial hypercholesterolemia, otherwise known as FH. I'm a pattern A. How much weight can I give to that as a predictive of future health regarding cardiovascular disease? That's really, really a good question, John. And I have to tell you, I wonder about that as well. I tend to lean on the opinion from what I've seen so far that the pattern A is more important than the level. However, the, you know, there, there's not a lot of science out there yet. It's piling up. It's getting started. It's not available yet, though. It's a great question. And again, my perspective is it's the pattern as opposed to the amount. LPG, you may be on the wrong channel. Um, sorry, guys, you know, for those of you who had to put up with it, <clears throat> I, you know, a couple of times I just I didn't connect that that was who it was. And so, you know, sometimes I'm slow to the uptake, uh, especially when I'm distracted trying to get content out. So, I'll try to be a little bit quicker next time. Shark Air, Beck S, yep, carbs are poison. Shark Air, D3 is on my desk, so thank you. Bobby Ocampo, Association of Vitamin D3, or Vitamin D Level with Heart Inflammation. My chip, mine shows 59. Um, yes, I recommend that you focus on D3 level and get somewhere between 60 and 90, Bobby laugh out loud. I live primarily on carbs. I've studied this stuff since age 17. Anybody who tells me I can't eat potatoes, I run from. I eat salmon and beef once a week. Uh, B. Flint, good IMT provider from Cardio Risk in Manchester, Vermont. Thank you, B. What's the recommended limit of LP, little a? You know, we see people that have up in the 80s, you know, they talk about 30 to 40 or less being healthy, depending on whatever, what lab you're looking at. And it also depends on the units. These people that are in the 80s, even the 120s, I'm not concerned about. It's the guys that are 700, 800, 1500, folks like that, that have appeared on my channel, like uh, Chuck, Chuck Campbell, or um, 
oh gosh, there was the other one. The I'm blanking on his name right now. He helped with the channel some. And he had both LP little a and FH. And he was in his 70s just cooking right along, doing great. Uh, okay, Fort Worth West Side. Carbs are poison. That's too broad of a statement. I would agree. Uh, number one, you want to make sure, first of all, you want to make sure that you're one of those majority of people that has problems with it. Number two, you want to look at the glycemic value. For example, I recommend the eating all the carbs you can. Now, does that sound weird? As long as they're fiber carbs. Uh, fiber is a carb as well. So I do recommend eating a lot of fiber. Okay, body produces carbs it needs from gluconeogenesis. Yes, that's true. There's no question about that. But it also tends to not produce carbs to the level that you have uh, inflammation. That is a key difference, Fort Worth, West Side. It tends to be the exogenous sources of carbs that tend to drive inflammatory levels uh, of carbs. S.H. Lee, what's the best diagnosis test for soft plaque? Said it a couple of times, S.H. Let me repeat it. The only one is IMT, C-I-M-T, cardia, uh, uh, carotid, intima, media thickness test. It's an ultrasound technology with a computer information set up on it. We've got series of multiple videos talking about it. And these things where we talk, where people are referring to cardio risk, that's what they're talking about. S.H. Lee. Oh, okay. Rachel, C-I-M-T. You're exactly right, Rachel. Thank you so much. Fort Worth West Side, if your glucose is over 100, no need for additional carbs. Absolutely, Fort Worth. John, it's sad when you see so much hate in a room. I truly enjoy. As my father said, don't argue with the kids and damn fools. He was right. <laughs> good point. Very, very good point. Just ignore them. Let them do their chatter and move on. Uh, LPG, the main question of the time, a lot of the time is, what's the difference function between K2, MK4, and MK6? Uh, K2 MK7, as always, great job. Thank you so much, LPG. Yes, there's a whole big, you know, there's multiple. There's MK1, MK2, M all, through, all through the series. The two that really make a difference are MK4 and MK7. Most of us would say MK7 is the, the best, and um, I will leave it at that, LPG. John Tocho, $20. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. I appreciate it. So your point on statins, how else are studies going to be funded? Didn't really quite understand that, Parker. Uh, I think it was a conversation at AK. Bart Robinson, you don't need AK negative. Hemoglobin and hematocrit is a little low. Do I need iron? Well, maybe. Um, what are your ferritin levels? Darminder Kumar, my calcium score was nine last year. Congratulations to you, Darminder, on a low level, but you have plaque now. So if you have plaque, what are you going to do about it? I would recommend that you consider the full risk association with cardiovascular disease because it's not just people with a calcium score of 1,000 that are at risk. You are, by definition, at risk as well. Daniel, Dr. Brewer, is there a possibility to get an online consultation? Well, of course, that's what we do. Um, Gilbert, if you will show Michelle's phone number. There you go. So, Daniel, if you just call that phone number, people do it. I mean, this happens all day, every day, uh, every day of the week. And um, we are, I will tell you this, um, we are likely to start uh, closing out some of the open slots for me. And it's, as I said before, the Alabama project, you've heard the old analogy about the dog that caught the bus. <laughs> there is a boatload of work to be done there and it's great work. It's, you know, we're saving a lot of lives there, just like we save lives on the channel. Um, but we still, we're still, still seeing people, Daniel, and just call that number and you get it get it done. You can get it set up. Theresia Smith, how important is ApoB versus the lipid panel? Well, you know, that's a really good question, Theresia. 
I've had, you know, um, oh, I can't remember his name right now. The fellow that was a surgery resident at Hopkins and went on to do more longevity stuff. <sighs> somebody remind me of his name. Um, he did one and he interviewed somebody and they started talking about how ApoB is the big one. Apo means the companion, apolipoprotein is the companion protein that forms the particles. So Apo A forms HDL com, uh, components. Apo B forms LDL, VLDL, IDL, and the others. Some people would say, oh, it's all about the Apo. What, what it is, and theoretically it is, on a practical basis, does that mean you get nothing from the fractionation? Not at all. Does that mean you get nothing from the cholesterol panel itself? No, you need all of those. And I hate to tell you this. I am late for my uh, patient appointment. We still, as usual, gosh, we've got a lot of interest today. Yes, Peter Atia. Thank you, Harvey. Um a lot of interest, a lot of really good questions. Uh, I apologize that I have to run, but I do have to run. Thank you so much for your interest.